Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Molly McCoy, actually, and um, I uh, am a prosthetist and orthodist, and my connection with Naked Prosthetics is that um, I've been working with them to create this presentation and this um, online uh, education material for their product, the biomechanical prosthetic finger, and that's what you see uh, pictured there. So, like I said, I'm a CPO and I've been in the field for over 20 years. And what I do is I help, uh, I, my company is McCoy Consulting, and I help practitioners um, with documentation, billing, um, and uh, claims help, that sort of thing. And um, I also create training programs for companies for uh, like technical trainings for their products. So, um, <clears throat> that's my connection to Naked Prosthetics, that's my background. If you have questions during this presentation, please ask them during the presentation. Um, that just makes for a much more dynamic uh, presentation, and uh, it's more interesting for everybody because, you know, if you have the question, probably 10 other people have it as well. And we probably have a lot of um, other healthcare providers on the line, not just prosthetists and orthodists. This presentation is geared toward prosthetists and orthodists, but um, there is definitely a lot of information in here that's relevant to hand therapists or front office personnel or um, or doctor's office uh, employees. <clears throat> so if you're on here and you're not a prosthetist or orthodist, there should be lots of good information for you about the biomechanical prosthetic finger. So I'll get started here just to kind of give you a general overview of what we're going to cover during the presentation. Um, and, uh, and what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about the finger itself, the prosthesis itself, but we're also going to talk about um, some, uh, some details about the technical specifications of it, what the patient population might be for it, um, evaluation fit and follow-up information, all of that. What we're not going to cover is um, the cost of it, how you would order it directly. We'll, we'll talk about the measurements and such, but those kind of things, you're going to want to call Naked Prosthetics directly, and they'll uh, help you out with that. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, this is really more of the technical side of it. Um, so having said all that, um, I wanted to point out, and maybe a lot of us know this, uh, maybe not, we'll see, uh, but there are 41,000 finger amputations per year in the U.S. That's according to the CDC. That is a heck of a lot of finger amputations. So um, this is just a huge patient population, which I think we could probably agree has been fairly underserved, uh, at least for prosthetics um, in the past. We haven't had great options typically. There are definitely finger prostheses out there and available, and they're good um, for what they do. What is different here is that this is a functional finger prosthesis. And that is really um, different from, say, the um, M finger, which would be functional and a cosmetic restoration, or it can be both. Um, and then maybe the X finger that you might have seen, which is also a functional and cosmetic restoration. Both of those are going to usually uh, have a cover um, put on them, which is fine. If that's what your patient is looking for, those are great options. However, what Naked Prosthetics noticed as a company and what uh, the person who invented the finger noticed was that there wasn't so much a finger for folks that just wanted something that was very, very functional and not a cosmetic restoration. So something that's going to be more durable, more protective, um, and really very functional in how it moves, uh, and not so much concerned about how it looks, really more about uh, getting back to using the fingers in a manual, very manual and dexterous way. So. So do you see patient with uh, finger amputations currently? No, 10% of us don't. So that's, uh, that's great that you're on the call today because I think what's nice is that this is a good option for folks who don't see a lot of um, folks with finger amputation um, for whatever reason, but this is a good functional option that is easy to get into, easy to work with, um, and is really super functional for your patients. So. And then it uh, looks like a lot of folks see people, yes, more than once a month, and some see uh, some, some folks uh, more rarely. So a pretty good split here that people do see uh, folks with finger amputation. So never fear, I'm not going to ask a question every 10 seconds. Um, but one more question is, do you feel like you have a good solution for people with finger amputation? 
Okay, so like, right, wow. <laughs> so 95% of people don't feel they have a good solution. That's a lot. So I, of course, we're a little skewed because if you thought you had some great solution, you probably wouldn't be on this webinar today. But still, it highlights the fact that, um, you know, we do need more options for folks that have finger amputation. And, you know, and that's what we're going to talk about today, this, this newer option. So that's good to know where everybody's at. I already did the overview, so I'm not going to talk about that so much. Um, and we'll move on to the company of Naked Prosthetics. What I don't want to do is give you a boring company background that you're going to say, why do I even care about this? I, you know, I don't care about their history. What I do want to say, though, is that the interesting thing about this company um, is why they were started and how they were started um, um, and how relevant that is to us clinically, especially as, uh, as prosthetists. So it was started by an end user. The gentleman had a, a finger amputation due to a firearms accident. After the amputation, he went to the doctor, the surgeon said, okay, well, do I get like a, a replacement finger? Do I get a prosthesis? And the doctor said, well, I don't really do that. We don't really have anything good for that. So what you do is you just go um, and get some therapy and get it kind of desensitized. And then you'll just uh, figure a way to work around it. You'll come up with compensations on your own. You get used to it and you get right back to things. No big deal. Right. And so this guy said, well, that's not really good enough because what I want to do is as soon as possible, get back to repairing bikes and working in a shop. And in order to do that, I have to have some protection for this hypersensitive residual finger that I'm left with. Um, so after his amputation, he did have some hypersensitivity, but he still wanted to get back to what he was doing, um, working on bicycles. So he made one himself. Um, and this does happen a, more frequently now in PNO um, than maybe at other times uh, in the past. Um, and it does happen in other medical fields. Of course, we've all heard people say, I didn't need to go to physical therapy. I just, uh, you know, walk up and down the stairs 65 times a day. I figure that's the same thing. Right. So it happens to them. It's happening to us more. We used to be a little exempt because people maybe didn't have the equipment they needed or it was too expensive or what have you to make their own. Now people can do that a little more. So what that brings up is do we have sort of a customer service mentality, right? If someone comes into your office and your clinic and says, I want a function a finger prosthesis, are you going to say, well, you know, they don't really work. We don't have any good ones or here's the selection, but they're not great. Uh, so go on and, and try without and see how that goes first. And then if you really, really want one, I'll give you one. I know for me, I, a particular patient comes to mind who came in who was a nurse and she wanted a cosmetic finger replacement after a finger amputation. And I thought, you know, I can give you a cosmetic finger that will actually be beautiful and look amazing, look just like your fingers. Um, but it's going to be such a hindrance on the job that you'd be very limited as to where you could use it. Um, so <clears throat> that was a few years ago, obviously, but Still, I didn't have a good solution for that person. Now that we have more options, we'll be able to say to that patient, yes, we can give you a finger prosthesis. Here are the different options. And if that patient says, I want something that's super functional and protective and strong, but I'm not necessarily concerned about a cosmetic restoration, then um, this might be the finger that you would be able to choose because that's exactly the niche it fits into. So um, what's nice too about this company, just quickly, is that after the gentleman who invented this finger um, had, had done the work of kind of coming up with the design idea or the beginning designs of it, it was evolved from there by startup entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs, that is a hard word. Um, so once they got a hold of the company and started working with the design, um, what's nice is it's a very small company and it's really customer service focused. Um, so as far as for us as practitioners, it's really easy to call them and communicate with them and ask questions. It's not this behemoth company that you can't get a hold of a person and talk to somebody about it. Um, and they also really recognize the valuable role of P&O clinics um, and how that fits in. So what's nice is they'll be able to um, interface with uh, patients or referral sources and say, um, now that you've taken this course, right, um, that if someone calls up and says, well, I want to I want to get one of those fingers, they can say, great, here are, you know, some piano facilities in your area that um, will be able to help you with that. And, and they recognize that that is going to be a good avenue for folks to um, have a place for follow up and have a place for long term care uh, regarding their prosthesis after their amputation. So that's just kind of a nice thing um, that is good to know for, for PO practices, right? So 
now we'll talk about like, why do we need a functional finger prosthesis? Is there really, um, you know, is what niche are we fitting into here? And I kind of hinted toward it earlier, but again, functional versus cosmetic. We, if you don't want something or the patient doesn't want something or they're not appropriate candidates for a cosmetic restoration or, or a functional prosthesis that has a cosmetic cover on it, um, because those are somewhat delicate, um, then this would be the niche that it fits, that, that can fill that role because again, it's a stronger prosthesis. It protects the residuum, but still allows fine motor function. And it actually facilitates that. And then of course, if you can protect the residual limb and allow functional use earlier um, in the rehab process, then you're going to be able to rehab much faster. So that's another place that can be helpful. Um, because it has that minimalist design and you'll see a, a more blown up picture of it here coming up, but you can see it there tiny in the corner. Very minimalist design. It's got few moving parts. It's uh, one material throughout, and the the uh, material's durable. It also has these really uh, low profile joints, which means, and we'll talk about it in detail in a minute. Basically, means you have more range of motion of the finger and ab and adduction, which is helpful. Um, and you can wear multiple prostheses on one hand without ending up with this sort of giant bear claw action that you might, might, you know, worry about with someone wearing multiple prostheses. So, okay. So someone asked how much residuum is necessary for a good fit. We're going to talk about that in some detail coming up, but basically the, the prosthesis that we're talking about today is what they call the PIP BPF or the PIP biomechanical prosthetic finger. And the candidates that are best for that are going to have an amputation distal to the PIP joint. So pretty much anywhere distal to the PIP joint. Um, the, they do have an option for folks that have amputation uh, proximal to the PIP joint and distal to the MCP. Um, but, so, you know, right in the, the proximal phalanx, um, but, uh, or phalange, I'm sorry, in the proximal phalange, but uh, that one is not what we're going to focus on here. You can certainly call Naked Prosthetics and talk to them about that if that's the type of prosthesis that your patient needs and they can walk you through that process. Um, and they are going to have a thumb prosthesis at some point right now that's still in the early stages. So I believe it's not available yet, but so we're talking about, you know, the four main fingers, um, mostly folks that have an amputation distal to the PIP joint. So again, we'll talk about it in more detail, but hopefully that basically answers the question. Um, so on this slide, what I wanted to focus on where it's um, just uh, finger amputation impairment. If I know we probably have uh, quite a few hand therapists on here, so this is you know going to be a bit of a snoozer for you, but um, I'm sure you guys know this. But um, uh, but just uh, to keep everyone on the same page, if for me as a prosthetist, I think um, I'm used to working with folks that have uh, more proximal amputation. So I didn't often look at the impairment that might be. Uh, a problem for folks with a more distal amputation of just fingers until I started working with this particular prosthesis. So, um, so just to highlight, if someone loses their finger, um, has an amputation of the finger um, at at the near the PIP. Um, so you can see that here, the proximal interphalangeal joint right there, um, or the the DIP too has impairment. But if they lose it in that PIP area. They have 80% finger impairment. So the whole finger is less functional. Um, and it, so it's 80% of its functionality. It's 20% impaired, right? Um, and the whole hand, so we're only talking about losing one end of one finger. The whole hand would be impaired by 16% in that instance. Those are big numbers. 16%, excuse me, 16% less functional. Um, of the whole hand would be 16% less functional and 16% impaired um, by missing just the end of that one finger. That's kind of a big thing, right? So again, as prosthetists, if we think about when someone comes in and says, well, I want a prosthesis for this. And we say, ah, yeah, I don't know. you probably don't want that. Or, you know, like, do you really want that? What are you going to use it for? Because most people just sort of get, get on with it and like have some compensations. Now, if you have something you can offer that's much more functional, um, then you, and you look at how much impairment people are dealing with just losing a part of their finger, it makes more sense to say, well, wait a minute, I do have some good prosthetic options for you. Let's talk about that. Um, so one thing I want to highlight here is you'll note that if you lose your pinky finger or your ring finger, that's not going to be as much impairment. That makes sense, right? I mean, logically you think, 
obviously the more important fingers as far as function goes on your hand are going to be your index and middle finger and your thumb. Those are kind of the, the keys to most of the grips that we use um, and most of the things that we do. And your, your uh, ring finger and pinky finger maybe are slightly less, um, uh, less of an impact if you, if you have an amputation there, although there is an impact. So if you look at those numbers, they're not small. Um, so uh, when we think about how much is the person impaired or how much uh, you know, functionality have they lost, we think about how many fingers are gone, obviously more fingers, more impairment. Um, sorry, more fingers missing, more impairment. Um, and then we think about which fingers are gone. So if we've lost just the end of a pinky finger, we're going to have a much more functional hand than if we lose just the end of our index finger, right? Makes sense. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay. So of course, when we, when we, after we say, okay, well, how many fingers are missing? Which fingers are they? And how much of each finger is missing? The next question is, you know, here's an individual patient with individual needs, just like all of our patients have totally different needs, depending on what's going on with them, notwithstanding their amputation or not just their amputation. That's not their only issue. You know, um, we also want to look at what are the patient's functional deficits, um, you know, specific to them. Uh, so what I found interesting too, to highlight is that often we think about, especially again, I'm, I'm going to draw on my experience as a prosthetist, um, often when I'm fitting people with hands, uh, you know, prosthetic hands, uh, we would have the three jaw chuck option, the standard open and close myoelectric hand in a three jaw chuck pattern. And because with that hand, you often lack a lot of conformity in the grip or ability to um, really wrap up an object and control it with dexterity and, con and, uh, and, and full movement of each finger, we would replace that with just straight up strength, right? So most of a, a three jaw chuck prosthetic hands are going to have something like 22 pounds of pinch force in those three fingers when they come together. 22 pounds of pinch force is just over the top, kind of ridiculous and really unnecessary. If you have dexterity of the hand, if you have range of motion in your fingers and your hand, you can have uh, more range of motion to wrap around an object and control it, and you don't have to rely on brute force, right? <laughs> and that's just backed up by the AMA Guides to Impairment where they say, you know, really grip strength isn't correlated to uh, performance of ADLs as much as range of motion would be. So we'd much rather have good range of motion and ability to conform to an object than we would just brute force in the hand. I don't have to tell anybody this basic anatomy, I would assume, right? Because even if you as a prosthetist or orthodist never see people with hand amputation or finger amputation, you're still going to know basic anatomy here. I would just say like from my own experience, and I'm going to tell you funny anecdote uh, number 105 here, is that I was talking to a colleague just the other day who said, um, who I said, well, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, this webinar and I decided since I didn't see a lot of upper extremity or finger amputees in my practice, I thought I better tell everybody what the joints of the fingers are. And he said, oh, give me a break. You know, we're still clinicians. We know our anatomy. You don't have to review that. And I said, really, do you remember the name of the joint uh, at the thumb between the, um, the metacarpal and the carpals in the thumb? And even with that hint, he was like, uh, yeah, I can't remember that one which I couldn't either when I started working with this, this device. So I thought, yeah, let's just go ahead and do it. A quick review. <laughs> so once you see these, of course, you're going to go, well, duh, I remember all of them, but <clears throat> because it's not often something we do as frequently as say a lower extremity prosthesis, we just go through them really quick. You have your distal interphalangeal joint, your DIP, you have your proximal interphalangeal joint, your PIP, and then you have your MCP, which is the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And again, you see those terms, you see where it's at and you go, well, duh, makes total sense. But if it's been a while, if you've forgotten like I had, the inner phalangeal joint would be the, the most distal joint in your thumb. And then you have your MCP joint of your thumb, which is the more proximal. And then that mystery joint, the carpal metacarpal joint. Again, pretty clear once you see the name and you see where it's at, but the CMC joint is just something to review. Okay, I won't beat that dead horse anymore. I just thought it was a funny uh, discussion that we had <laughs> about that. So moving on to the patient population. And again, stop me if you have questions as we go, but I'm just going to keep moving forward here to make sure we, we stay on time. Um, but 
our patient populations, um, when I, again, drawing on my experience here, when I first started working with this thing, I thought, well, you know, like I could see how this would be really good for someone like a plumber, right? It makes sense to me that you need really good conformity of grip. If you're trying to hold on to something that is wet or smooth, it, like in this case, you can see like that shiny metal um, part uh, that is potentially going to be wet through the entire job, right? And you, you need to be able to feel if it's hot or cold. So you want to get some pr proprioceptive feedback. You need to be able to manipulate it. And of course, you also need to be able to protect your hands during all that because, you know, as a plumber, that's a manually uh, pretty, uh, you know, hardcore task that's going to subject your hands to a lot of uh, bumps or, or, you know, pressure or whatever would often trigger um, some phantom pain uh, or, or just pain in the residual finger. Um, so this made sense to me that you would need protection and you would want to be able to conform to complex shaped objects and so I thought, yeah, plumber is a great person to wear a prosthesis like this. Makes perfect sense. What I didn't think about as much was maybe someone like an office worker. Would they have as much of a need for a prosthesis like this? But as you go through and you think about what the office worker has to do um, and what their hands are involved in, and again, for hand therapists that are listening, this is probably kind of a duh, but um, I would think, you know, Maybe they're not going to want a prosthesis that doesn't have a cosmetic cover. But <clears throat> again, as I go through what they do during the day, I think, well, they make small repetitive movements. They need to do fine motor tasks and they need to be able to do them quickly and efficiently. And when I think quickly and efficiently, and you can start thinking about your documentation here, what you don't want to do is after an amputation have to learn again how to type. Right. If I type most of the day, which I happen to at this point in my career, um, then I and I use a 10, 10 finger typing. I do the, the standard 10 finger typing and I lose a finger. It's going to take me a very long time potentially to get back to full functionality at my office job if I have to learn a whole new way to type. So that's where if you can get a functional finger prosthesis on there, then you could potentially get back to typing right away because you're not going to have to learn a new way. You can do it the way you did it before the amputation. So that's just a really big deal. Again, thinking about our documentation and thinking about what you would write up, the idea of returning to work quicker because you don't have to relearn a task um, is a really strong argument for having a functional prosthesis on your, uh, in place of the finger. Um, and then, of course, writing, um, typing, paper handling, all of that is going to be a big deal as well for folks. So we have that fine manipulation. And here's a picture of someone typing. I wanted to put this on here because if you'll note, the very distal end of this prosthesis um, flexes quite a bit. It can, and it can be tuned to flex more or less depending on the patient's need. So for someone who is typing quite a bit, they might want a lot more excursion or movement in that distal joint so that they can reach all the keys on the keyboard. Um, and they can do that, uh, again, missing the distal uh, end of their finger because the, um, the proximal part of their finger that's left is going to drive the movement at the distal end. So this could be, you know, very, very helpful for someone that is uh, typing and doing those fine motor tasks like that. Okay. And then um, the example of sort of tying your shoe um, and getting and holding small objects and manipulating things like that, that, that takes some fine dexterity is a big deal. Okay. And so as far as uh, protecting the residual limb, again, uh, you know, do we have pain with finger amputation, you know, is that a common problem? So this may seem um, like a basic question potentially, um, but you know, is it true or false that pain is very common for folks with finger amputation, um, but maybe not well documented um, in the literature? So I'll give you a few minutes to decide if you think it's a common issue or not. Probably don't have to give you a ton of time. I'm, I am going to close that poll, even though not everybody voted because this is where it was going. Yes, it is a problem. There is a lot of pain um, for folks with finger amputation. Now, there isn't a lot of literature, like I said, that, that says, uh, yes, we have a, a full-blown um, you know, research paper that has investigated amputation pain in, in folks who have lost a finger, because there isn't a lot of 
uh, published literature on finger amputation at all in any realm. So, uh, so uh, suffice it to say, there isn't anything directly related to pain that's out there, not much. So the published evidence is limited, but if you go on sites or again, for those of us on the call here that are hand therapists, I'm sure you hear it all the time from your patients, but also if you go on to, to sites that, um, have a lot of folks who are amputees and they're, they're talking back and forth, like in a, in a chat group, um, almost you almost guaranteed that you're going to have most of the people talking about the pain or the hypersensitivity or the, just the general discomfort that they're experiencing. Um, and of course you can imagine why that might be right. Obviously lots of nerve endings in our fingers, but thinking about the scarring that goes on and the tiny surgeries that have to happen there and often a thin flap closure. So again, as a prosthetist, I'm used to seeing someone with a transtibial amputation where they have this nice, uh, pardon my my uh, crude crudeness here, but a nice, literally meaty flap at the end with a lot of muscle belly left that covers up the distal end of that bone, right? And so I've got often, almost always, a lot of protection there. But then think about our finger amputations. Now, of course, we're talking about with this prosthesis, amputations that are more proximal. But um, I will say the only pictures I could find of more proximal amputations were way too gory and just not necessary. We don't need to see that. We all know what it looks like. Um, so I'm using this just to highlight that you notice that often you will lose a lot of the part of the hand that you would be able to use for cushioning or coverage um, when you lose the end of the finger. There just isn't a lot of tissue there to, to aid in closure. Makes perfect sense. So again, often we end up with uh, you know, uh, residual fingers that are hypersensitive or uncomfortable and they need protection. Um, so I will say again that in, in a prosthesis like the, the BPF that we're talking about today, that has a ring type socket. So you wear the, the prosthesis goes on like a ring, provides coverage and protection, almost like a roll cage around the finger. But because it's not a fully enclosed socket, it can also um, allow some desensitization. It can allow uh, proprioception to a degree. Um, it can also um, allow people to be fit a little sooner in the recovery process because we don't have to wait for their volume to fully stabilize, right? We have some room to allow volume fluctuation because it's not a fully enclosed socket. So those are some things to think about. And if we can do that and protect the finger, again, we're gonna have the patient rehabbing a little faster. Um, and go on. It's really variable for folks. And how much of an effect does that have on functionality? It depends. How bad is the pain? And what do you need to do with your hands right away? So um, again, that's something that's going to come into the notes when you're documenting why this patient needs a finger prosthesis like this. Because if their pain is at a very high level, um, and if they have a job where they need to return soon to manual work with their hands, then um, absolutely, that's a great reason to consider a prosthesis that protects the finger and allows them to get back to work at decreasing that pain. Okay. So um, not to beat this dead horse too much because um, we've already kind of talked about the, the basics here, but I just wanted to highlight the, the fine motor capability. And again, I kind of mentioned this with that last slide on typing, but the, the linkages of the finger can be modified and customized so that they match what the person is doing most often. So again, you have an office worker that's typing more, you might want more excursion in that distal end, um, where if, if you have someone who's doing a, more of a, a job, I'll just go back to the plumber for ease here. But if you have someone like a plumber that's doing that kind of work, then maybe you don't need as much range of motion at the distal end. Um, and you could, you know, limit that if needed or change the angle that it starts at. Um, so also with this finger, because it's low profile um, and the joints are very thin, um, you can have uh, more finger abdomen adduction um, without, any, without much impingement. And that allows for that more conforming grip. And again, as we know, if we can conform to the object that we're holding and we can approach it appropriately because we can pick it up however it, it, it presents to us um, without a lot of body compensation, like extra shoulder movement, extra elbow movement, uh, extra torso movement, anything like that, if we can decrease that body compensation by conforming to the object and controlling it on the first grab, that's going to be better for long-term outcomes. The reason I want to highlight that is because, again, getting back to documentation, those are the things that need to be documented. 
when you're when you're putting through a claim for insurance. We are using this to decrease the body compensation of this person who is doing a repetitive task like picking something up off a conveyor belt every day. If they have to do that um, while avoiding the finger touching anything or while trying to compensate for a finger that doesn't conform to the object and help with the grip, that's going to be bad long term, you know, for for overuse injury and what have you. So. Um, and the, the prosthesis does have a soft finger pad area, so um, and it, it's kind of a rubbery tip. So if they um, pull an object off of the off the table, they want to pick up a paper or something that requires sort of um, grippiness, like a fingerprint would have, um, then that's possible as well. The gross motor capabilities, um, again, pretty basic there as far as we've already talked about why you'd want to control that with, with the plumber example, but that's kind of the idea is that. You want to be able to have more fingers, more surface area, touching the object to conform to it and manipulate it. Okay, so let's talk about the durability and the strength of this. Again, if we compare this prosthesis to what we have available currently with other finger prostheses that you know are available to, to patients now, um, this is a very durable uh, material and a very durable design. So, uh, you know, I don't have numbers. Is it uh, more durable than the current fingers that are available? Of course, it's going to depend on what the person's doing and how they're using them. But I can say because it doesn't have a, a cosmetic cover, instantly it's more durable, right? Because you don't have to worry about the cover getting damaged. And because it's this medical grade nylon that's really strong, and then they further strengthen it with um, another process after it's created um, to, to give it extra strength, but not add thickness or bulk or anything. Um, that it turns out to be much more uh, strong and, and long-term um, uh, durable than what you'd find in say an aluminum or a standard pro uh, plastic with pulley systems and what have you, which um, pulleys, uh, cable pulleys are often um, a little problematic, or especially in the hands, can, can be a problem, right? So this avoids that cable pulley issue, right? And then uh, they're very lightweight. They only weigh 20 to 30 grams. I looked up what 20 to 30 grams would be because in my mind, I don't see a picture of an item when I, when I see 20 to 30 grams. So I'm like, what does that mean? How much is that? That is, uh, according to Google, that's 20 paper clips. So, oh, so, sorry, it's 19 paper clips. So maybe that helps you picture how light it is. Very, very light. Um, and then the design is really customized to each person. So it's going to be created for that patient and for their activities to work for them individually. Um, and then again, the design of the linkage is very uh, durable. So uh, a quick side note here on 3D printing. Um, so a lot of us have heard of uh, 3D printing recently. There are several different types of 3D printers. So I know for me, I'm, I'm not an engineer, right? As a prosthetist, I have definitely heard of 3D printing and I'm aware of it, um, but I didn't know necessarily the differences between types of 3D printing and one being more for hobbyists or prototypers, so not as strong, uh, versus one being more professional grade or long lasting. Uh, long lasting uh, as far as the material, uh, the SLS printing. So again, saying that there are many different kinds of, of uh, 3D printing, um, but SLS uh, 3D printing or the material that's used in SLS, which is uh, laser sintering, right? So um, is very long lasting and professional grade and is used for parts that, again, car parts, right? Go into cars that are going to be on the road for hundreds of thousands of miles experience high heat and pressures and that kind of thing. And they can still make it. So just to give you a visual for me, this makes some sense. I kind of get this, but I need a visual, right? So a visual on this would be like, here's an example of an FDM 3d printer, um, more of the hobbyist type, right? Something for prototypes, making toys, little things. And I mean, it looks like a toy. The, the printer itself <laughs> looks kind of like a toy, but you get the idea. It's kind of more of a, um, a hobbyist sort of machine. Whereas an SLS 3D printer, which is this one, is what is used to make the, the BPF. Uh, those are going to be more like something you'd see in a machine shop, right? And again, the resulting product is definitely professional grade, um, industrial strength kind of stuff, unlike the home hobbyist 3D printer. So just give you an idea. Okay.
So um, now, again, keep questions coming if you have them. I'm going to keep plowing through to the next part of this, which is shifting gears a little, because we're just going to talk about how you would go about fitting, uh, measuring, evaluating for the prosthesis on, on a patient um, to give you some, um, some background there. Uh, so we're going to talk about, again, focusing on the PIP solution. The, this is what they call the PIP, biomechanical prosthetic finger. Again, because this is going to be the prosthetic finger that's best for folks that have an amputation distal to the PIP joint. So this is the one we're going to focus on in, in uh, the next few slides. But I did want to make you aware that they do have a solution for someone who has a more proximal amputation. It's called the MCP PPF. Um, and that would be a different order form than what we're going to talk about. It's got hand-based suspension. You can contact Naked Prosthetics, and they're happy to explain that to you, give you pictures, show you how it works, all that. Um, and then there will be a thumb prosthesis uh, at some point uh, in the future that's still in development. So just to make you aware. Okay, so measurements for the PIP solution, right, the one, again, that's pictured here. Um, what you'll use are sizing rings, and they uh, Naked Prosthetics will give you a sizing kit. It has a bunch of sizing rings. I'll show you a picture of it here in a second. Um, and you'll have an oval or round option, you know, because we do have different shapes, fingers, different shaped fingers, right? And different areas of our fingers are different shapes, right? We might be round, more proximal, and more oval as we get distal. So um, that's why you have those two options. And it's just what you would think. When you slide the sizing ring on, you'd want to be able to push the sizing ring up or down, side to side, have the patient move in it a little bit and make sure that there isn't a lot of gapping and that it fits well, it doesn't impinge on the web space, et cetera, um, and that it's tight enough to stay put and not so tight that it cuts off circulation. The standard, right, <laughs> in, in fitting almost anything. We want it tight, but we don't want it so tight that you can't get blood in there, right? So, um, so that is uh, just a picture of how those sizing uh, rings would, would work. So um, trying that on uh, the finger and then having the patient flex with it on just to see, you know, how that kind of work, you know, if there's a lot of gap or that kind of thing. If there's gapping, you go down a size, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're going to measure different parts of the fingers. So talking about that, here's the order form. It tells you exactly where they need the measurements. Um, and again, you would take that measurement with those ring sizers that you're going to get from Naked Prosthetics um, at each of these locations, and then they might be oval or round within the same finger, right? So here I might have on this first measurement an oval number, whatever, 27, let's say. And then on this second measurement at the largest part of the PIP joint, I might have a round of 29, right? So you be aware, it's kind of a big point that you can mix and match oval and round throughout that finger. And you want to do that because you want to make sure that you have an intimate fit um, for the whole length of the prosthesis. So, and then you're going to do um, a measurement with the finger bent um, and that might differ. That's okay. It might differ from the other measurements. That's okay. And then you're going to take a range of motion um, uh, goniometer measurement. So, uh, if you, like me, I, I'm sure, again, hand therapists, you know exactly where your finger goniometer is. I'm sure that uh, that's not going to be a problem. As a prosthetist, I'm sure I lost my finger goniometer uh, long ago because they are so tiny um, and clear usually, right? But you can get uh, one from Naked Prosthetics if you need one and uh, we'll come with that, thing, that ring sizing kit. And then um, you'll want to just take the measurement that you see there in the picture with the goniometer. And note this uh, little line here underneath that last measurement, um, that you must have 60 degrees of flexion at the PIP joint. Um, so you, there can, you can get a prosthesis for someone who has more limited range of motion, less than 60 degrees of, of flexion at the PIP. However, um, uh, you'd want to have, you'd want to talk to them first and understand like that limited range of motion, how that's going to affect how much movement you get at the distal joint, at the DIP of the prosthesis. Um, and that may or may not work for your patient. So you're going to talk to them and say, this is what my patient wants to do. This is the lack of range of motion, or this is the limitation in range of motion. You know, how, how will that affect it? And they'll walk you through that and tell you, you know, well, they will be able to do this. They might have a harder time with that, et cetera. If your patient has 60 degrees of flexion there or more, then you're going to have the full functionality of the prosthesis. It's not going to be... Uh, anything that you need to call about would be typical. 
So um, then the next step would be to take a color scan of the hand next to a ruler. Um, if you, that's the ideal setup. I don't, a lot of folks I know don't have a color scanner available in their offices. If that's the case, or if you're out and about doing this, um, then you can use a camera. Just be uh, really, really careful to make sure that you're parallel to the surface that the hand is on, right? You just don't want to um, move the camera uh, and tilt it because that will affect, you know, the angle of the picture and could affect the, the measurements and what have you. So if you do have to use a camera, make sure to get it parallel to the surface so you get a good picture. And always put the ruler with it, but that's right there on the form. So hopefully that'll be helpful. You, you won't forget there. Right? I'm going to move through these slides very quickly because um, a lot of this we've already talked about and it's here for your reference. So you, you will have the slides that, like I said, they'll be in that, um, that email that you get after this presentation. So you'll have these. You don't have to write all this stuff down. Um, and I'm just going to pick out the highlights that we haven't necessarily discussed yet. Right. So as far as evaluation goes, I don't have to say again that thorough questioning is incredibly important here about the functional tasks that this person needs a prosthesis for. So the ideal way to do this, or maybe the easiest way, is to take the patient through their daily tasks prior to the amputation and then take them through the same daily tasks, you know, verbally after the amputation and say, okay, when you got up in the morning, could you make your own coffee easily? Now, can you make your own coffee easily? You know, now, did you, were you able to do your hair and put your makeup on? Can you do that now? You know, um, those kind of things. We want to talk about all those little tiny ADL scenarios. You know, we want to talk about all the activities of daily living this person engages in and whether the amputation has affected those, those ADLs or not. And if it has, in what way? And that way we can evaluate is a functional prosthesis for that finger or those fingers going to give you that function back. And that is your exact justification and your exact clinical reasoning that's going into your notes for the insurance company, for the doctor or the therapist, for the patient. So everybody's on the same page as to why you might need a prosthesis and how it's going to be used. Extreme detail is going to be very important here, just like it is with anything that we do. Um, but here it's even more important because the tiny tasks and the simple things that we take for granted that our hands do, those are the kind of things we want to highlight here in our notes. Um, and the goal would be, you know, to really hone in on what they could do before that they can't do now. And then look at that. Is that going to be something that wearing a prosthesis will will take care of, you know, will will bring back to you? So um, you do have the option of using uh, like a test finger. So you can call Naked Prosthetics and say, you know, can, you know, can we get one um, for the patient to just see how it feels or see how it works? Um, and they will give you one. Of course, it's a generic uh, finger, so it may or may not fit spectacularly well, but it will give them a general idea of how it works and what it feels like, um, how light it is and all of that. So if you have one of those, if you end up um, having them send you one of those, then make sure that becomes part of your evaluation. Use it to, you know, have the patient do some little tasks in the office and say, you know, was that easier or harder, recognizing that the fit will be better on your own personal one, but <laughs> um, was that easier or harder and and um, and then make some notes on that. And and that way the patient can really understand what a difference it made or didn't make for them. So we want to know that. Um, the other thing you can do uh, with or without having the test finger there, if you have the test finger, this could be helpful. If you don't, it's going to be helpful as well is looking at some sort of functional grip test. Um, and so what you'd want to do if you if you have the test finger there, have them complete a functional grip test with it and one without. Again, recognizing that if it's not a custom fit, um, that their time would improve more uh, with one that fits exactly to them. But it can give you a general idea if it's going to help or not, or it can give you also a general idea of how their body compensations might have de decreased or how more, much easier it is to do the task, how much more comfortable because they're not having issues with pain in the residual finger, etc. This is a picture of a Jepson Taylor test kit um, that obviously you can make if you want uh, or you can buy them complete, whatever floats your boat. Um, and it's a pretty simple test. You would just have the person um, pick up the objects and you get instructions with it, pick up the objects and put them down in a certain order, time that and write it all down and then you do some scoring. A pretty easy stuff. Um, however, I will say if you don't have a therapist in your area, uh, I'm, obviously I'm talking to a prosthetist here, if you don't have a therapist in your area that is familiar with these types of things or does, or you know, certified hand therapists are few and far between often. They're 
uh, it's pretty common that you might work in an area where there isn't a CHG anywhere near you. Um, so if you don't have a hand therapist near you that will do these evaluations on your patient, or you don't have an OT that is experienced or interested in doing that, you could do it yourself and you would still get some good, valuable information. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Having said that, your best bet for insurance approval and for billing and documentation that way is to get more of a team involved. So if you're putting this through an insurance billing, if your notes say this is you know, the deficit that we're dealing with, this is what the patient needs, this is how the prosthesis is gonna work, this is what it's gonna do for the person, and then you pull in a therapist who has evaluated that person's hand function using whatever test, whether it's this Jebson Taylor or anything else they use, and they say this person has these deficits, the notes together are very powerful and more likely to have the claim supported and paid. Whereas if all the notes are coming from just you as the prosthetist, you don't have as good a chance of, of the claim going through. It's still entirely doable, but uh, you just support your claim better if you get some therapy notes in there. But once the patient has tried on the test finger, or once you've gone through the options with them um, and, and you as a group have decided that this particular prosthetic or prosthesis is the best option, then you want to, from that appointment forward, um, maybe have them keep a log until their next appointment. This can be really powerful stuff to have the patient. It's a little bit of a hassle, but they can, they can do it just for maybe two, three days. It doesn't have to be for two weeks, um, but just a few days, have a little notepad sitting there. And when they go home, just make a little note or, you know, if they can't write at this point, in their rehab, uh, you know, a voice memo on the phone, whatever, um, and have them document over the next few days what tasks they could and couldn't do very easily, um, or anytime they think, oh, that was a pain. If I hadn't had this amputation, I could have done that. Make a note of it right there, because those are the little details that are hard to remember when you're sitting there in the prosthetist office, but are really powerful information and, um, and things that are going to be easier to think about when they're in the moment. So, um, and again, putting that through the insurance company is very powerful documentation. Um, someone put in the question, ASHT or HTCC are good websites for the P for P&Os or, or prosthetists to find a nearby CHT or certified hand therapist. Thank you. I'm going to right now type that into the chat so that everybody can see that. So if you want to find the certified hand therapist in your area, you can go to the ASHT website um, or the HTCC website um, to find, I'm going to put to find hand therapist. Thank you for that. That's great. So that's typed into the chat now too. If you guys want to make a note of that, uh, then you can. Thank you. That's helpful. Appreciate it. Okay, and then, oh, one more question. And someone else says, Amer oh, oh, and those stand for American Society of Hand Therapists or Hand Therapy Certification Commission. Thank you. That's good to know what the acronym, what the acronym is. Um, what is the L code for the device and is it reimbursable? We're gonna talk about reimbursement right now. The L code is a 99 code. So um, you are gonna use a, a miscellaneous code for it. They have had um, quite a few paid for through insurance. Uh, having said that, so that's helpful, but I'm going to talk about individual insurances right now. Uh, so let me get to that slide. I'm going to, because we only have a couple minutes left, I'm just going to plow ahead here. Um, fitting, not a big deal, not hard. If you have questions, you can call them. This is in the notes, so I'm going to go right past that slide. You'll have it in front of you. And the follow-up is really standard follow-up as far as what we would do for prosthesis, no matter what, standard stuff. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that. I do want to get to, though, that insurance part because that question, that's an important question. This we've already talked about, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, but billing Medicare, okay, there's no LCD for upper extremity for prosthetics for Medicare, right? So there's no local coverage determination or national coverage determination for upper extremity prosthetics. So what that does is it doesn't necessarily give you a guideline for, for how to write your notes, but the bottom line is you want to talk about, again, thinking about a Medicare patient. Medicare's metrics for success are really, can we do self-care? Can we continue to live independent? Can we improve our health by doing exercise? Can we imp improve our overall quality of life? No matter what Medicare is paying for, they wanna know, is it going to uh, lead to an improvement in these areas? And the reason that is, is because these are the areas that if people have an improvement in any of these areas of their life, 
they cost less. Okay, so if I can do my own self-care, I cost Medicare less. If I can live independently and not in an assisted living facility, I cost Medicare less money. If I am overall satisfied with my quality of life, I also cost less to Medicare. So if you can link anything that you bill to Medicare to these areas and show why it will improve people's outcomes in these areas, then that makes sense to Medicare and that's how you get things paid through Medicare. Pretty basic, but we know it's not that easy. Um, but you know, that's the general rule and that's the case with this finger. We really need to not just say person needs a finger because he's missing a, a you know, because he's had an amputation. That's not good enough. How does this finger make an impact in those areas that Medicare is concerned about? That's what you need to say, right? If you're billing private insurance, of course you look up the policy first. What you'll find probably is there is no policy directly re related to prosthetic fingers, although they may have an upper extremity prosthesis uh, policy, that's pretty common. So use that as a guideline, as a starting place. Um, and then of course you're gonna address their policy requirements and if your insurance, if your patient's insurance is provided by an employer or they're self-insured, then you really want to focus on uh, your notes and your documentation. It's going to focus on getting them back to functional daily tasks and return to work. Quick recovery, back to work. I cost the insurance company less. Okay. If you're looking at L and I, then you really want to focus on back to work. If I get back to work and I can go back to the same job, I don't require. Uh, training for a new job or everything that goes with that, then I'm going to cost them less money. And that's what they're looking for. So that's what you want to say, you know, is this, and that's, that's what the patient needs too. That's, I'm not saying make notes up to fit this. I'm saying when that patient comes in there and they have L and I, their goal is probably return to work. And if that's the case, that's what my notes should reflect. So just to be clear on that point, um, the question came up, what is LNI? That's labor and industry. So that would be um, the insurance that people get when they're injured on the job. So if I lost my finger uh, in an industrial accident while I was at work, then labor and industries um, insurance is going to cover that. So it's kind of like uh, the employer has insurance to cover accidents, right? Uh, you, thank you. Workman's comp. That's the word I wasn't thinking of. Also known as workman's comp. Yes, exactly. Appreciate it. Yep. So, okay. And prescriber training, that's pretty simple stuff. Um, you want to talk to your referral sources about uh, the, this prosthesis being available. It is brand new. So you want to definitely find the hand therapist and the occupational therapist and the hand therapist and the hand surgeons in your area and let them know um, what this, the, what this is. If you have a large group of surgeons, large group of therapists in your area that you would like in service on this, then call Naked Prosthetics. They can work with you on that um, and, and bring uh, potentially the materials or the people out to train that group. Um, so talk to them about that for sure. Um, and so you're right, this was scheduled to end at one and everyone will receive a copy of the presentation and that was the last slide. So, um, this is the contact information. And again, uh, anybody who is registered today will get the slides in an email and a test in an email. If you have any questions, please do um, contact Naked Prosthetics and, and they can answer those questions for you. So, I very much appreciate your time. And I think I went over by two minutes. I do apologize for that. Um, So that is the last slide, but there are some more questions. I will continue to answer those questions. So, but <clears throat> someone asked, what is the fabrication time? At this point, I believe the fabrication time is eight to 10 weeks. So um, it, there is a, a, a lengthy time because you, they're actually making or creating each one as the, as the information comes in. So they're individually made. They're, it's not like there are parts sitting on the shelf that they, they create the prosthesis with. They're all individually made. So around eight to 10 weeks, and it's going to depend um, on the type of prosthesis that you need. So that's a general. And thank you. Someone also asked, what's the warranty? It's a one-year manufacturer's warranty. So um, if anything goes wrong with it, uh, just through regular wear and tear. Although um, if the patient uh, damages it, um, call them and, and talk to them about that, what kind of damage it was and what happened. Um, and, uh, and they may be able to work with you on that. But Bottom line is it's a one-year manufacturer's warranty. 
Another great question. Thank you uh, to this person who's asking these awesome questions. Um, what um, adjustments or tuning is required after fitting? At the vast majority of the time, 90, 95% of the time, that device is going to come back. It's going to slip on. You have shims or um, like uh, silicone shims that will go in there to make any fine adjustments um, and to accommodate limp, uh, volume fluctuations. So most of the time it's going to come to you and you're going to slide that on and it's going to fit done. If it needs to be adjusted, um, then you would just make note of those adjustments, call Naked Prosthetics, talk to them about that, send it back and they will re uh, make adjustments to whatever piece needs to be adjusted. Um, but most of the time because of the measurements they're getting and the discussions they have with you and the way they're able to fine tune it, it should fit right when you get it. Um, and again, you have some shims to kind of take up any space. Um, someone asked, what do I mean, mean by a 99 code? That is a miscellaneous code. It would be an L7999, um, I believe, for opportunity. Um, and so it's basically a code that um, you can use for an item that doesn't have its own. Th thank you, 7499. That does, if you can use that for any uh, item in prosthetics and orthotics that doesn't have its own code. So that's what that is. Thank you. Um, and how long, another question is, how long do you anticipate this will last or what's the replacement time? Um, that is, uh, they've done tests on it. It should last every bit of two to three years with like daily use in a uh, average to harsh environment. So if we look at someone who is uh, a bike mechanic or a plumber or something like that, um, it should last anywhere from two to three years in that type of usage scenario with everyday use. Um, of course, it's going to depend based on the patient, how they use it, blah, 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 you know, and stuff. But um, overall, it should last uh, two to three years. That's the anticipated length of time. And someone asked, how long, do, or does it take a long time to get adjustment done? Another eight to 10 weeks because edema can fluctuate as time goes on. Um, absolutely, that's uh, something that, uh, that they're aware of, and, and uh, it does not take eight to 10 weeks to get adjustments. Of course, it depends on the adjustment. If it's to the to the ring itself where uh, the suspension happens, um, then that would be a pretty quick turnaround for a change. Um, if it needs multiple adjustments, then that's going to vary. But no, it's not an additional eight to ten weeks. Um, uh, it, it would be less time than that. But, um, and then someone asks, is the fingertip replaceable? And that's a great question as well because it has that soft pad. Um, or I should say it's not soft, it is um, rubbery, right? So it's definitely very durable and it should last, um, you know, at least a year, if not more, but it is replaceable. Um, you can either send it in and, and have them put a new one on, um, just like you would reline a hook, um, or uh, they can send it to you and you can do it in the shop. So, uh, but yes, it is replaceable. So, um, and is the tip of the digit text friendly? So I think you mean like touchscreen friendly. Um, and there is a coding on it. The coding um, allows it to be text friendly, but um, uh, sometimes that coding can rub off. So um, yes, it is. They're exploring better options for how to um, make that last longer. Um, so it's kind of a yes and no. It, it does, but if that, if that coding um, comes off, then um, it's not going to be touchscreen uh, compatible. So um, exploring ways to make that more durable. But in general, you're probably going to end up using a different finger for the touchscreen. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for your attendance, for your um, for your attention as well, and also for um, for joining us on this webinar. Really appreciate your time.